So I know, I know lunch has come up next, but Carl, I just realized we've known each other for, oh my God, 17 years. And so yeah, too long, thanks a lot. <laughs> but anybody, you know what, or a lot of you guys are engineers, and I just want to do a cautionary trail, uh, tale at my expense. Is, uh, I met Carl a couple days after Bellingham, and I'm like a normal engineer, you know, somebody's questioning what I'm doing. I was a little indignant. I was a little bit, uh, I guess, resentful. I and, a little yeah. <laughs> and, and the worst part is uh, a, a tad patronizing. But then, you know, it hit me with the science. And, uh, and you know, they had, they, you had uh, retained somebody for the city. Remember uh, Bob Iber, I think it was? We retained some experts. Um, even the company retained some experts. And uh, we actually crafted a corrective action where if you go back and look at it, it looks like the integrity management rule back in 1999. I was just looking at it and go, wow. And that's when everybody gets together and they collaborate. And it was just, I, you know, it was ahead of its time. But that's, uh, I want to thank you for that. Um, but the th three things I learned from that lesson, I learned it quickly because they uh, offered me up like, a, like fresh meat, is, is if, the, um, I think the guy from NAB talked about it, if, there, if the, if the um, community doesn't have a, a voice, you're going to fail. So you got to make sure that the community has a voice. You got to make sure you get the information out. I mean, it was crickets. I mean, we weren't allowed to talk because the NTSB says you can't talk. But because we couldn't get information out to the community, they thought nothing was happening. Pipeline Safety Trust, uh, at the same time with Safe Bellingham, at least facilitated some of those things. And the last thing, and I was looking for the slide, Carl, I couldn't find it. You got to have a credible regulator. And we were, there was a, there was a picture of a big oil in a suit, smoking a cigar, and he had a little dog, a little yapping dog called Fluffy. I was Fluffy, it said OPS actually on the side. <laughs> so that's what happens. I mean, if they don't feel like they don't, if they don't have a voice, they don't know what's going on, if they don't feel there's a credible regulator, you're gonna fail. So uh, just remember those three things. Don't, you know, I learned the hard way, and all you guys will have your Bellingham or your Marshall or your uh, plane, so. Uh, just learn, but I do appreciate Pipeline Safety Trust. If they weren't there, my job would be a lot harder because they do a lot of the outreach for us. But let's get into the data. Um, okay, I'm gonna just build upon what Carl said. I looked at uh, the data from 2010 to 2015. I cut it on a three year interval, okay? Um, I, I put both the uh, liquid and the natural gas on the same slide. You see years of service on the X axis. You see the classical bathtub curve. You might wonder why hazardous liquid kind of illustrates that bathtub more, but we have a lower threshold for reporting for liquids. So uh, that's why you uh, see that. But basically in the first, I think first three years, uh, one, out of, uh, one out of five of the incidents, reported incidents are occurring within the first three years after installation, one out of four in the first five years. So yeah, you're seeing a big percentage of total accidents occurring in the uh, first few years. Since I got better data on liquid, I, uh, I, I mind that uh, uh, I mind that because it's, uh, we had a lower th reporting threshold, and you see the red the red bar chart. That's the total miles of pipeline in the country. We basically have gone from 180,000 in 2010 to a little over 200,000, and the, the uh, green bar is the miles added each year or installed each year. And you see the number of accidents. That's that purple line. It's actually trending the the new pipelines. It's not parallel in the old pipelines. It's basically following the new pipelines almost, almost exactly. So um, I wanted to look at where these accidents are occurring. So I looked at all pipelines, regardless of installation date, all the way back to the 30s. And back then, and this, I, I don't know who brought it up yesterday, you know, but this illustrates that only 23% of the right away, I mean, only 23% of the spills for all pipelines are occurring on the right away. Another 5% are occurring on the facilities and uh, migrating off the right away. But you know, most of them are on the uh, property. And then you look at new pipelines, and almost 80% are, are contained in the, uh, the, the operator control property, and only 9% are on the pipeline right away. So then, that's good, you know, the impact of the communities are not so bad. But let's figure out you know, how these are failing. 33% um, of, 
of the accidents are occurring, all, this is where all pipelines are occurring, on the right-of-way or at the valve sites. No, <laughs> absolutely not. I didn't think you were. No. <laughs> so, um, so let's break down and let's find out where these spills are occurring for the recently, uh, for the recently installed pipelines. And we only can use installation data. Unfortunately, we don't know, we don't collect when the thing is put into service. So we do know what, what year they're installed. 63% of the total failures for new pipelines are equipment failure. 24% are incorrect operation. So I said, well, well, let's drill down a little bit further on that. Okay, so let's first go to the equipment failure. Most are pump or pump-related equipment. A lot of threaded connections, a lot of, um, you, know, uh, you know, relief devices, it's tubing, uh, pump seals. So, okay, so, you know, stuff, it, you know, at first appearance, it doesn't look like it's being, being installed correctly. Then let's see what people are calling incorrect operation. This guy kind of similar vein. It's the biggest hunk of uh, the incorrect, incorrect operation releases are from equipment not installed properly. There's also a bunch on overflowing. Looks like things associated with process, you know, uh, overfilling tanks, uh, relief devices, uh, I mean, uh, pipeline being overpressured. So you see a kind of a a split between stuff that's not installed correctly or not operated correctly. So I don't want to diminish, though, what's occurring. So, oh, it's stuff's on the, uh, this stuff's on the property. It's no big deal. This next slide is a telling slide. While the, the preponderance of the spills are on the property, the bulk of the unrecovered amount is on the pipeline right away. Basically about the, looks, Roughly about 80, 83%. Uh, so while only 9% of the spills are on the right of way, 83% of the unrecovered volume are on the right of way. So I wanted to drill down into that a little bit further. And this is where the data kind of struggles. There isn't that many releases on the right of way. Over the last five years, two releases, two releases accounted for 95% of the right-of-way spills. And they were large releases. One of them was a Mark West release in West Virginia, and the other one was, I think it was, um, I can't remember the other one, it was an Enterprise release. And, and both of those releases were associated with ground movement. One cracked the well due to subsidence, and the other one was impacted by outside force damage during a mud flow. So the data takeaways are, yeah, spill, yeah. You know, spill rates, Carl's absolutely right. They are occurring at a disproportional rate on newly installed hazardous liquid pipelines. And it's good news that the vast majority are not on the right of way. The bad news is when it does occur on the right of way, you get, yeah, that's where the damage is done. Equipment error and incorrect operation represent 87% of the failures on newly installed pipelines. So that's a, uh, you can look at a half full, half empty, as it appears that the pipe is being constructed well, but regardless, there's just a lot of, there's a lot more, the failure rate's a lot higher for newly constructed pipelines. And we need to do more research and data analysis on failure causes from these right away related spills. So what are we doing about it? We are stepping up inspections and enforcement for new, uh, for new pipelines. Uh, we now expend about 15 to 25 percent of our total inspection resources just inspecting new construction. This is a change um, based on this data. We're going to be revisiting pipeline operators more often the first few years. That's when stuff manifests itself. It's you know, whether it's you know uh, incorrect operation, operator qualifications, um, incorrect, uh, incorrectly uh, placed gaskets. We we got to get in there a lot the first couple years, for at least the first three years. Um, I really think the OQ for new construction is going to help a lot. Um, I can talk about things anecdotally. Um, well, okay, I'll talk about things anecdotally. Um, <laughs> I've had a lot of pipelines where we've squatted on the stuff. We've been there side by side. Uh, uh, is there any Trans Canada people here? Can I talk about bison? Okay. 
they had people crawling all over Bison Pipeline. Uh, we, we had our guy there full time. The, the coding, the welding, everything looked like it was going to fine. And within a few days, few weeks of going into service, it ruptured catastrophically. It was in the middle of nowhere. It was in Wyoming. But then when we um, excavated it, you could see some, it was basically um, external force damage. There was just backhoe teeth in it. So when they were lowering it into the ditch, despite all this oversight and, a, and a probably the beginning of a QMS system, where it failed was the last person to touch that pipe putting it in the ditch. Uh, we see that we had a, any Chevron people here? Okay, I can, I can talk about this. Um, <laughs> you were there, uh, at Salt Lake City. Uh, they did a great job. They rehabilitated the pipeline. They didn't pull the water out of the valve at the very end. And the first cold snap, they popped the bottom off and it spilled. It wasn't new construction, but it was akin to new construction. And so many times, and I think that's what QMS is going to close that gap, is things they get done like 99% of the way, and then it's just that last person that touches it. Screw, uh, just screws it up. Yeah, another one we had was we had a pipeline that was put into service, and then there was some permitting delays, a few things, and they didn't apply CP to it for four or five years. And then uh, they ran a smart pig right away as soon as they put it into service, and it was almost eaten all the way through. The adjacent pipelines had basically been using it as an anode. So it's... It's so many of what we, so many things we do, we got to focus on closing that loop. And I think the 1169, 1177, uh, 1169 is the inspector training, 1177 is the QMS, is that correct? Did I have that right? I think they'll do a lot to close that gap. So thank you very much. <laughs>